In this edition of Art Rocks, we'll explore the contemporary choreography in an LSU dance performance. I think the dancers, they're very open to new ideas. I think that's what I really love about these students here at LSU. Learn there's more than what meets the eye when looking at a Norman Rockwell. And if then you choose to spend more time looking at it, then more of the story gets revealed. A jazz musician passes the musical baton to future generations. Entertaining audiences is wonderful. It's very rewarding. But the educational part of it is really to the heart of the matter. And a collaboration of local artists draws us into the gallery. Most people are awestruck. They just can't believe what they see on the walls. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads magazine, and this is Art Rocks. We begin our show today with a look into the mind of a choreographer. Instructor Sandra Parks brought together LSU students in dance and music for a recent performance. Modern Dance, choreographed to music by Sergei Prokofiev, was adapted for Theatre in the Round on the LSU campus recently. The opportunity for creative staging at the Riley Theatre was seen as a welcome challenge by Sandra Parks, the head of dance at LSU's Department of Theatre. I think the dancers, they're very open to new ideas. I think that's what I really love about these students here at LSU. They they're really eager to do something new. When Parks was approached by the LSU School of Music faculty to choreograph a Prokofiev quintet, she envisioned the music being performed by the LSU Dance Ensemble. Parks began a collaboration between the LSU School of Music and the Department of Theater's student dancers, actors, and production crew for the recent LSU Fall Concert. In the modern dance piece, My Hero, My Tragedy, Parks began her work by looking at the Prokofiev score itself. He basically just composed it for a performance troupe, like kind of a touring group in Paris in the 20s. And that's about it. That's all the information I got. And so then I'm like, well, where am I going to come from as an artist? So I dig a little bit deeper in terms of what's going on in Paris in the 20s. Researching a period rich with creative energy in every medium and genre, Park's exploration expanded to include literature from 1920s Paris, eventually focusing on authors T.S. Eliot and Ernest Hemingway. I was working with the dancers. We used certain quotes from Hemingway, and I told them, okay, find a, a word that speaks to you. Let me see what um, and, and they will create a pose, and we will play like that and just draw from what they do, and then I'll piece it together. And uh, we actually joked about it. We have a Hemingway phrase. Like this, all different poses. They just, we just all combine them together. The musicians themselves became a physical element of the performance as they repositioned on stage between movements. When we move, the musicians is not just simply moving them and, and it involves a moving instrument. So, and I want to respect that and, and give the audience an opportunity to see how delicate these instruments are as well, especially the double bass. There was another quote that uh, stuck with me is, um, if you give me a hero, I will give you a tragedy. And so the piece kind of evolved into this one particular dancer immersed herself into this world, into this open environment and, and see how she went along with the, each stage of her life in this environment. Music is such, a lot of times you don't need a language to understand it or to appreciate it or to, to be inspired by. Sometimes it's a simple melody or the rhythm or the the, the entire composition that makes us feel something.
And then thing, dance is the same way. We don't need the language to understand the dance. And sometimes it's the hard part because we don't have the language, so we don't understand. Movement, most of the time, will give anybody some impact and some will influence their thoughts and their experience. They can relate to the movements in their own way rather than giving them a specific concept or an idea or this is what you're supposed to feel, this is what you're supposed to understand, you're supposed to get from this. But rather you, you can go in and then experience the dance your own way. Like I'm sure everyone sitting in the audience look at the, the work and have a complete different ideas and, and, and I think that's beautiful. It's hard for some audience members because sometimes it's, it, the, the uncertainty is very scary, but for me, that's a beautiful part. Now, let's take a look at some of the upcoming arts events happening across Louisiana. For more information on these events, visit the website at lpb.org slash artrocks. And to find more arts activities, check out countryroadsmag.com. Next, we'll visit the Newark Museum in New Jersey to re-examine the iconic work of American artist Norman Rockwell. Though the appeal of Rockwell's images in part lies in their visual accessibility, the museum's chief curator advises us to look beyond the surface. The exhibition is really a survey of Rockwell's career, and although it's divided into various thematic categories, what it really is about is how he himself changes as an artist and a man over the course of his lifetime. I'm Ulysses Dietz, I'm the chief curator at the Newark Museum, and I'm the curator of the Norman Rockwell exhibition. The two paintings I chose as my favorites out of the exhibition really resonate with me because they both deal with African Americans, which is something that is not traditionally associated with Rockwell's work, and yet is something that is an underlying theme of a lot of his career and becomes a motivating theme toward the end of his career. The magic of all of Rockwell's magazine covers is that you get the story instantly. And if then you choose to spend more time looking at it, then more of the story gets revealed. It's initially a very simple thing. It's a little boy on a train trying to figure out how to calculate his tip while the African-American waiter looks on, smiling. It's a very archetypal Rockwell adult-child interconnection. An adult being protective and benevolent toward a child who wants to live up to that expectation. But beneath the surface of that is a much more complicated story. It was an acknowledged policy on the post covers that no African American could be shown except in a position of uh, service, of subservience to any white people. And that is carried through in that we have the, the little boy is a customer on the train and the African American man is the waiter, so he is his servant. But what's interesting to me in this painting is that Rockwell takes that truth and I think very consciously subverts it by making the African-American waiter both servant and master. He is the adult, he dominates, he's looking down on the little boy, but he's looking down on him with this protective paternal look on his face. So it gives him a position of power and dignity, which is really pushing the boundaries of what the policies in journalism were at the time. The second gallery in this exhibition focuses on his later career and centers on Murder in Mississippi, which was published in 1965 as an illustration in Look Magazine for an article of the same title. I think it's the most powerful image, most modern image he paints in his entire career, but I'll also say it's the least attractive picture. It's not one I would want to live with, but it's one I can't stop thinking about. 
he's commissioned to do this illustration for an article that is about the unreeling story of the murder of three young civil rights workers uh, in Mississippi at the hands of uh, rogue sheriff and the, the Ku Klux Klan. And they are singled out by this sheriff and his cronies, and they're essentially kidnapped, beaten up, and then shot point blank out in the country and then buried in shallow graves. And all of this becomes part of Rockwell's research, part of that complicated, obsessive preparation style. He goes so far as to obtain human blood and to buy a white shirt like one of the men is wearing to get a sense of what it would really look like. He researches poses, he researches uh, lighting. I mean, he does a whole different kind of research in this than he's ever done before to produce this extraordinarily sort of chilling moment, which is literally the moment when they look at their captors just before they're killed. So it's an extraordinary dark and chilling moment, and it's something unlike anything Rockwell has ever painted. Indeed, the painting, the finished painting, is not the painting that was published. What ultimately gets published is the sketch, which is unheard of in all of his long career. He never publishes a sketch, ever. But this is the one that, to him, had all the emotional power of it. There are a lot of other paintings that appear at the end of his career, and while none of them are quite so uh, dramatic and graphic, a lot of them are touched by his shifting vision of the way the world is, which is to say he can no longer pretend that anything is perfect and romantic and beautiful. And all of his later work tends to touch on some aspect of this brokenness. And uh, it, it makes his later work uh, fascinating. And while I focused on these two paintings because they represent such a dramatic shift uh, in Norman Rockwell's style over the course of 20 years of his career, they really are just the tip of the iceberg in what is an extraordinarily rich visual feast for anybody who's interested in commercial art, anyone who's interested in fine art, or interested simply in the evolution of an artist. In our next segment, we meet a music producer determined to turn young people on to the rhythm and soul of jazz. A former entertainer himself, Larry Rosen knows how early exposure can breed an appreciation and a lifelong love for jazz. So, how exactly is Rosen making this genre of music more accessible? Let's find out. <laughs> Larry Rosen and I'm the producer of Jazz Roots and trying to spread American music all over the world. That's what I'm trying to do. I came up with this concept called Jazz Roots and said the music of the Americas comes from the roots of those drums that come from Africa, call and response, the rhythmic elements and so on. When it came to the United States and in the various forms that it took, it took on gospel, blues, jazz, rock, rap. It all came out of the same roots. So that is the DNA that connects our whole community together, never mind our country. I grew up in the Bronx, New York, and uh, went to school there and started playing in bands when I was in public school. But I thought jazz was, when I grew up, Benny Goodman or something like that. You know, it was like a long time ago. I really didn't know much about modern jazz and what was going on. And one summer, somebody played a Charlie Parker record for me when I was about 14 years old, and it changed my life. But the producer thing kind of came on, you know, organically, and I'd always loved the recording studio, and I loved the technology involved in it. We'd finish a take on something, I'd go into the control room and want to hear the playback, and talk to the engineer, well, what about this, what about that? So I built a recording studio in my house, and before you know it, I started recording music. Jazz is it's a hard thing to describe. It goes to a lot of people, it's a lot of different things. The range is just tremendous. 
But there's something in the core of the music. You know, we know that improvisation is probably synonymous with the word jazz. And then the spontaneity of the whole thing. And the other part of jazz is like the, the rhythmic element, the swing of it. But I guess if you say so, I have to pack my things and go. And I think in many ways, the show that we're doing now, it has so much of those elements in it. You know, when we talk about somebody like Ray Charles, Ray Charles is one of the most unique artists ever to have been born. He combined together gospel, R&B, jazz, every component of the elements of what this music is all about in, it, in his own way. He even did country music and made it his own. When they call him the genius, he is the genius. And he came from Georgia. Georgia. George. That's the name of the show. George on my mind, celebrating Ray Charles. A job as a producer, the way I look at it is, I look at myself as creating something. So here's a concept. What's the cast of characters to tell the story, basically? You know, Clint Holmes is an amazing artist. He is just an incredible entertainer. And he also brings together a lot of these elements of jazz and pop music and performing and soul. And he brings a lot of that. We're kind of hosting this evening. Do you want to talk bucket list? Take Six has been my favorite uh, vocal group since Take Six started singing. I'm singing with you. Ladies and gentlemen, Take Six! So I've done a number of different projects with Take Six. I mean, they are Sons of the South, number one, and they're a very unique blend of sophisticated jazz harmony, gospel music, and soul. Let me tell you about a girl I know. No, she is my baby and she lives next door. Then Ray Charles did duets with a lot of people, and a lot of those became hit records, like the things I did with Benny Carter, and I figured, I want to represent that. And so I reached out to Nina Freelon, who's a great jazz singer. And Nina Freelon, one of my favorite female vocalists. I'm singing with her. And then I needed that saxophone player, because Ray Charles had a small band. He had Fathead Newman and Hank Crawford. He had the greatest saxophone players in his band. So I reached out to Kirk Whalum and asked him if he wanted to do it. Kirk Whalum, like the perfect saxophone player. I'm jamming with him. And we're doing the music of Ray Charles. I've got a woman way over town. She's good to me. Entertaining audiences is wonderful. It's very rewarding. But the educational part of it is really to the heart of the matter. Longevity with playing with the musicians that you play with is the key to that. We bring in young people and they come in and listen to this music and we have the artists speak to them. We try to do every way to possibly get them involved in this. And once they start seeing what this is about, they fall in love with it. I didn't see a Broadway show until I was an adult. I didn't see a, a symphony orchestra till I was an adult. I don't know how it would have changed my life had I had the opportunity to see them when I was a kid, but you never know which one of those kids sitting out there. And I'm not talking about them becoming a, a musician. I'm talking about them growing up and not being intimidated by the idea of walking into Reynolds Hall and seeing a group of musicians up there. I think it's a great experience. So George on my mind brings together all the elements that I believe in totally that I think in a very, not only an entertaining show, you got to stand up and, and enjoy this show and clap your hands, but it also tells the story of American music at the same time. So it does both things. So for me, this is like the epitome. Jazz in many ways represents America. The United States is this melting pot of people coming from all over the world, many times disadvantaged. And these people have to find a way. And so it's a melding of cultures that came together to create this music. This music is really created by the American society that we live in. And I find that to be so special and so unique about it. And my mission in my life at this point is to get that message across. For more, check out jazzroots.net. 
Now it's time to celebrate another of Louisiana's treasures. This week we'll be rolling on the river as we examine the paddle wheeler. Steamboats played a major role in the 19th century development of the Mississippi River. The first paddle wheeler on the river began operating in 1812. By the 1830s, there were 1,200 steamers transporting passengers and goods along the Mississippi. Paddle wheelers could employ paddles at the stern or at the side. They could navigate shallow waters, maneuvered well, and could handle the strong currents of upriver travel. The steam engines were powered by wood and then by coal. The biggest dangers on board were fire and boiler explosions. As railroads developed and offered a faster form of transportation, steamers went into decline. Today's paddle wheelers are used for tourism and entertainment purposes, offering harbor tours and dinner cruises. Only a few of them are powered by steam engine. Two stern wheelers regularly dock in New Orleans, the Creole Queen and the Natchez. The current ninth version of the Natchez was built in 1975. It's made of steel and the steam engines, steering system, and paddle wheel shaft were salvaged from a 1925 steamer. The Natchez also features a steam calliope, which can often be heard from Jackson Square. For most artists, the opportunity to display their work can be critical to their art career. In our final segment, we visit the Artists' Collaborative Gallery in Sacramento, which not only gives local artists a permanent home to display their work, but also opportunities to contribute to the success of fellow artists. Let's check it out. As an artist, an independent artist, finding a place to show your work is difficult. And unless you're Picasso or someone like that, you're, they don't come knocking on your door. You have to go knock on their door. Artists Collaborative is a collection of various artists who bring all their work together and share with the community. We have painters, we have jewelers, potters, Fiber artists, pen and ink, glass, a wide variety of different types of art. And we, we try to make it that way. We want to have a wide variety and not all of the same thing. Before, I didn't have my work on display anywhere full time. I was going from market to market and a lot of times people saw my work and wanted to know where they could see it when I wasn't uh, showing. This is the first time, if you notice the rest of them. We, we came from down south and, and at the time that I had just started to promote my work, I had been in a couple of galleries. There wasn't a lot of traffic. I won a couple of prizes and I just hadn't really got my feet off the ground. But when I got here and, and, and was able to join Artist Collaborative, uh, everything just took off. The notoriety, uh, getting my name out there, uh, and I just feel that people are getting to know who I am. Every gallery member spends one day a month uh, volunteering to work in the gallery and uh, interacting with customers, talking about their own work and other gallery members' work. We all play off each other. We, we uh, get inspired by each other and also the, the displays uh, are so interesting because they are mixed with so many other um, artists. I think it's, it's a good experience because uh, you could talk to somebody else, another artist, and hey, we know, how do you do that? Or how do you do this? Or, or um, you see a different person's perspective. And um, I think, you know, like musicians, artists need to share. It's a one by one by about five inch block. When somebody's walking down the boardwalk here, we don't have a very big storefront. It's, it's a very, our gallery is very long and narrow and they'll kind of peek in and they kind of step back and they, oh, look, a gallery and they walk in.
when I, we have local people come through here, they're really amazed that these are all local artists. It's a place of its own here in Sacramento. Most people are awestruck. They just can't believe what they see on the walls. We do have a lot of work on the walls. We are not your typical gallery. We, are, we hang in what they call cafe style. And so we can get as much work up on the walls as possible. People need to see what other people do. This isn't just a hobby. These are actually, when you're an artist, you just can't help but do it. For more on the gallery, visit artcollab.com. And that wraps it up for this edition of Art Rocks. Be sure to drop in online at lpb.org slash artrocks where you can catch up on any episodes you've missed and find information on upcoming arts events. Until next time, I'm James Fox Smith and thanks for watching.